So we're uh, going to be reading a section of the um, one of the important uh, essays written by Ihi Dogen, who was a Japanese Zen master and founder of the Soto School around the year 1230. And... Um, this is called Instructions to the Cook, or Advice to the Cook, um, Tenzo Kyokun. Tenzo is the important cook, the head of the kitchen in a Zen monastery. And so has an important responsibility to nourish the uh, Sangha, the community. And here, as we have become aware a little bit, the nourishing is equally for the body and for the um, heart. So, but before I um, get to the section I want to read, which I'm not sure which one it is yet, um, because we have different oh, experience backgrounds of meditation and sometimes a question arises, it's, help, it's helpful sometimes to ask if there's a, a, something you're wondering about with meditation, perhaps just the sitting we, we did. Now, um, I, mean, I can relate that in my first experience sitting in a group, oh, I must have been 19, and I was in Montreal at a Zen priest he happened to be a professor of mine, and he invited me to come sit. And I had no idea what to expect or what to do. And it was a living room, and all of a sudden it was like this zen, you know, everything was just, I mean, it was like one guy in the classroom, and then it was like a zen master in the room. And he just, I just stood there at the door. I didn't know what to do. I had never sat before. And I didn't know what to do, and he just went, you know, <laughs> like, sit down. So I, I sat down, and it was two hours, like no break, nothing. Just sitting there. Then they ring the bell and have tea, and that was it. Every Monday night. And I did it. I did it faithfully, because I felt like, okay, now that I started it and I'm in this class, I have to do it. <laughs> and it was pure torture. Right? <laughs> it, I didn't go back. I, like I, a year, I left meditation or anything and do the Dharma, because it was so painful, and I just thought, can't be, you know, it's impossible, it's impossible. I felt like my legs were on fire, and I need help getting up. <laughs> Total waste of time. <laughs> uh, so, and then I look back at it, and the one thing I regret is when the bell would ring, and we'd have tea, I didn't just say, I have a question. Like, what do I do? I mean, I'm supposed to not... I mean, it's so painful, what do I do? You know, but I didn't ask. I was just too shy, and I felt like it was just part of the whole package. You know? <laughs> so that shouldn't occur here, of course. Um, but if something arises in your mind, you have a question, and you think, God, I don't know what to do with this, or is this what's supposed to happen, or, hmm. For instance, I'll give you a, one opening. If you're relatively new to meditation, there is no reason to force yourself to sit for half an hour. I mean, there's not a, um, you know, I don't know how to say it other than a positive correlation between the length and the quality of your meditation. Sometimes there's actually a negative correlation. <coughs> like the longer you sit, the worse it gets. <laughs> Meaning to say that if five minutes is what you can comfortably manage by sitting still and watching your breath, and after that you're just like forcing yourself because you think you have to conform to some standard, right? Who are you doing this for? Huh? Remember, you're doing it for yourself. Nobody else. Right? You're doing it to cultivate your mind. And if you start to develop a certain resistance because you feel like it's, you know, forced, counterproductive and you know take it from me because I did it and I then ran away for a long time which was a shame 
okay? So I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm recommending to be gentle and easy and just, you know, like any other type of training, like slow and steady wins the race. You know, that's all you need to do. You just have a certain commitment without expectation. And you know that sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's harder. You know? And you don't judge your meditation by the session. And I've said this many times, rather by the decade, okay? <laughs> by the decade, which is still <coughs> short term. Okay. <laughs> I mean, a real Buddhist would say by the lifetime. Okay, but you don't need to go there. Lifetimes. Lifetimes, yeah. Each lifetime, and hopefully. Yeah, but, um, but you can have a bad week. You can have a bad day. You can have a bad year, right? You just don't give up because you're still alive, so it's your responsibility <coughs> to continue. How do we know it's good for everyone? Mm. You don't. You have to know whether it's good for you. <laughs> well, I'm implying you speaking on general terms. I'm implying it's good for me. Yeah, it's good for you. So, I mean, that's kind of where you have to be sincere. You look at. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily uh, the cure-all, you know, that one practice fits all. I mean, if we look at even just, just meditation, just, and even if we look at Buddhist meditation, different places, cultures, and times in history have developed different approaches. Is this one, like the right one for you? Maybe, maybe not. No? But if you feel after giving it a good and sincere effort, right, you want to then explore, okay, what other meditations or, you know, contemplative practices benefit, then that's what you, you definitely should do. Um, and again, it's not a take it and leave it. It's not either or. It's like perhaps other, other um, approaches can complement I know for myself, um, the experiences I had, say, with Tibetan Buddhism helped a lot with my um, more open, formless uh, Zen meditation because it would help reinforce certain intentions of compassion that I wanted that were not being taught in the Zen way. So um, they were implied, but they weren't explicit. So I needed to go outside and find some teachings to help. Um, some people have said to me, you know, sitting is really hard. And I ask, how's your walking? Oh, it's way better. So walk more. You know, <laughs> do more walking. Because really, what is good for everyone is having your mind focused on your present experience. Yes, that is good for everyone. Now, what technique will help you achieve that is different. You know, and so yeah, some people have a lot have a hard time sitting still, but they really can, you know, be much more present walking. So yeah, I think that um, if we look at what the practices are meant to oh, awaken, uh, yeah, I think that awakening is universal and it's beneficial to everybody. But whether this specific cultural form and it's a cultural form is uh, useful. Um, you know, or skillful. That's you know something that you have to try after after trying out, giving it a good try. You know, skillful means was the talk was the term the Buddha used, upaya. You know, is this a skillful like a means? And again, it's a means. It's like a, a way to to get somewhere. So if that means isn't the best one for you, try it, and then. And then explore. So yeah. But yeah, awakening uh, to your true nature is universal. Is the universal good? <laughs> so yeah. <laughs>
Remember the old Zen saying, like, don't mistake the moon for the finger pointing at it. All these techniques are like fingers, right, pointing at the moon. And the moon is the nature of your mind. So you want to realize the nature of your mind and these different techniques and also different religions, I think, ultimately are doing that. But sometimes we're so interested in the finger because the finger is really interesting, you know. And then people are saying, this is the finger that knows the way, right? Um, and the Buddha was very clear in saying, like, he's not saying that this is the finger that knows the way. He was saying there's a, a famous um, meeting that the Buddha had with this group of lived in a place called Kalama. And the Kalamas were, uh, had a lot of spiritual teachers come in and out and pass through the village. And they said, like, we've heard this before. Everyone says this is the way. And they all seem, like, true. But how can they all be true? So how do we know which one is the right way? And he said, you know, when you know for yourself. Like, when you know for yourself. And it's not because someone tells you or not because it's an authority and it's not because, you know, your trusted friends are doing it and it's not because teachers are doing it or whatever. But when you really know for yourself. So, yeah, ultimately, I think one of the great things of this approach, or that's the Buddha Dharma, um, the, the Dharma, the teaching of the Buddha, one of the great things I find is that... Um, it really gives you, it makes you responsible. Like, it's not based on hearsay. It's like, are you experiencing this? Like, are you experiencing this? Because if you're not, then um, you're missing something. Like, it has to be your experience. If it's not, these teachings are not gonna, are not very helpful. Like intellectual knowledge, this is not helpful. You know, it's helpful if you wanna, I don't know, write a paper on it. But if you wanna change your mind, it's not helpful. Right. So the sitting is where we kind of face ourselves and have to be really honest. Like if you're sitting and your mind is really disturbed, you're going to know that. Okay. And if you're sitting and you're able to accept and just, you know, let be, you will know that. So. <clears throat> is there no such thing you can be in a state where it's like comfort zone? Where you're feeling you're feeling comfortable, but you're not progressing. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Right. It can be kind of a shallow and um, yeah, stuck. That can definitely happen. Um, that won't last a long time because you start to feel depressed. <laughs> No, um, being stuck when you're sitting starts to feel, it, it morphs into dullness. You see, the sitting becomes kind of dull. And one of the things that's important, um, one of the qualities, that that dullness is one of the five, what the Buddha said were these hindrances. Like, it's called sloth and topar, he said. Like, there's, you know, restlessness where you're agitated. There's ill will where you're feeling like angry or, or even hatred. There's sensual need and desire. Sensual desire doesn't mean I just want, you know, food and sex. Sensual desire can just be like, you know, I wish it were hotter in here. I wish it were cooler in here. I wish it were the lights weren't so bright. I wish, I wish it were quieter. That's also sensual desire, like that. That my senses are bothering me, and I want my senses to be more pleased. That's a hindrance, because it's endless. When you start to look for a more comfortable position in meditation, you're always going to be looking. Okay, that's central desire. Now, that's the third hindrance. But the other hindrance is also what's called sloth and topor, which I, I don't even know what they mean in English so much. Um, but it, the, the hindrance is dullness. Is where you feel like, you know, you might be calm, but it's a shallow calm. It's like the calm of like, putting a lid on something, but you open up the lid and it's like a can of worms, okay? Like, I don't see it. Out of sight, out of mind, okay? That's the dullness there. Like, I'm just going to use my breath as a tranquilizer, you know? And the tranquilizer, if you sit long enough, it wears off. When you start to notice that your mind is actually dull, what you need to do, though, is to sharpen your present mind awareness so that you're really looking at your breath, you're aware of the sounds, 
and you're also aware of the quality of dullness, you can bring awareness to mood, okay? You can bring awareness to mood, meaning you're aware of dullness. When you're aware of dullness, that awareness is not dull, okay? That's what, in, what is interesting. Let's say you're bored in meditation. Turn the awareness to the boredom. When you see boredom, that awareness of boredom is not bored. That awareness is just aware, right? Let's say you're angry. You're really agitated. Like, shut up already, you know? That awareness of the anger is not angry. That's where you start to notice the taste of freedom in mindfulness. The freedom of mindfulness is that the awareness of the phenomena, of the mood, and of the feeling, is not the same as the feeling. So wait, you mean I'm something other than that feeling? Yeah. You are not the anger. That's a liberating awareness right there. That is the gift of mindfulness, is that you don't have to identify with your negative states. And very often we experience negative states and we just start to identify with it like, I'm such an impatient person, I have no patience, right? I'm easily angered, right? And at some point, I'm just an angry person. I must go to therapy fast. Like, no. But who said you're this? The mindfulness is that you're none of it. It's happening. It's happening. And when we observe it, we start to see the other thing that's interesting about it. With all of these states, including the calmness, including the calmness, all of them are what in a Buddhist term, impermanent. Just meaning that they change. Like the siren passed. And when the siren passed, and I was irritated at the siren, and when the siren passes, then my irritation passes too. So this me that I was identifying with as an irritated person also passes. So there's nothing actually stuck to identify with. Now again, that's just another idea. The point of the teaching is to really, really experience that closely. So you start to get unstuck, right? Again, it does not mean you're going to be calm all the time because you're allowing everything to pass. Okay. It doesn't mean suddenly you're going to transform your personality. You're walking and you're just radiating goodness. You know, all those are ideas. But you may be able to simply have greater awareness of what actually is happening in this present moment and not to be lost in the narrative we make around it, right? All the stories that is a mind trip, it happens so fast that you don't even know where it came from. It came from having that story written over and over again. We're not making up new stories. We're like pressing play on the stories that we've already told ourselves. Yeah. Who am I without those stories and without my feelings and my thoughts? Like, hmm? what, what am I? Who am I? I don't know. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is me. This is part of me. No? That's who hmm? you really are without them. Your consciousness without those thoughts. That's who you really are. Hmm. Who am I? <laughs> I mean, that's the basic question. So, it's, could you ask it? Somebody had to ask it. <laughs> yes. Who am I without all those thoughts and the stories? <clears throat> I mean, I, I can't answer that for you. I, I definitely can't answer that for you. But, um, but what we can do, right? is perhaps hesitate before we answer it. That's what I think this is allowing us to do, is giving us a moment of hesitation before I answer that question. So here I think what's more um, helpful than the answer is the question. So that the question can sort of motivate us to explore because as soon as we have an answer we're kind of done 
Yeah. So maybe, but maybe not. Yeah. So if every answer we come up, instead of saying no, don't say no to those answers. Just say maybe. But it, but it's not the end of the story. Right. Uh, I think this is a um, a practice of asking the questions. Um, Oh, as a question. <laughs> the practice of asking questions. And you know, so I don't make my mistake. Um, one other thing I wanna I wanna I mention about meditation as a practice. And that, again, a lot of us come to it hoping that we will um, benefit or get some improvement in our lives. Self-improvement, self-help, meditation seems like a good thing. It's like yoga without moving. Uh, so... <laughs> now... And we got to think... Yeah. <laughs> well, good luck with that. At least you can take care of the moving part. But, <laughs> but then the disappointment happens because you go out afterwards and you wake up tomorrow morning or the next day or when you go home tonight and you're like, God, I just spent an hour reading news that I don't even, I'm not even interested in. Like, where's my mind? Or I'm just like thinking about this and where is my mind? You know, what happened to that awareness? It's gone. <laughs> and, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, of course. So, it's more like brushing your teeth. And it's a metaphor I, I bring in once in a while. And brushing your teeth is not going to transform your teeth into celebrity teeth. <laughs> okay? But it may prevent decay. Right? It, it may prevent the holes that then you're going to have to do serious work on if you just let them, you know, continue for years. And then the drill comes out. Right. <laughs> it's basically keeping a sense of, you know, a bit of um, mental hygiene. Mm -hmm. So that you can notice, just like when you feel, oh, I got something on my teeth, like I just need to get, I need to brush that off. Like that is just, I've been carrying that too long. And first you just have to notice that it's there. And then you sit and you breathe. And the breathing is the brushing. It's like gentle brushing. Your breathing is like gentle brushing for your mind. Yeah. When you hesitate and you don't follow the disturbing thoughts, then you're slowly brushing your mind in a gentle way so that the plaque that builds up can be released. Yeah. And like if you brush too hard, it's going to make your gums bleed. Okay? So you feel like, gotta do this. You know? It's not going to help. Okay, you're going to cause stress like happened to me. But if you don't brush and you miss a few days, it's not going to be a disaster, but you're going to feel a difference. And after a week or two of not brushing, okay, it's going to be uncomfortable. And then the worst thing about that is, you get used to it, right? You get used to it, so you don't even notice that you stopped brushing, right? You don't even notice. <laughs> Until one day you wake up, you go to the dentist, and it's like, you got like 12 holes in there, okay? Now, 
you want to keep sensitive to the fact that, you know, oh, I think there's been a buildup of some agitation I need to, I need to brush, gentle brush, gentle brush, it has to be a soft brush. And there's like some sweet thoughts, there's some bitter thoughts, you know, there's some salty thoughts, you know, they build up. The things that you've been eating during the day, they stay on your teeth, right? The thoughts you've been having during the day, they stay in your mind. You need to brush them. It's not forcing them out, it's being aware of them and not indulging them, not eating any more of it. But each breath is like a gentle brush. And then you bring your teeth back to their original state, which doesn't have any of that bacteria on it. Right? So the brushing of the mind is bringing it back to some original state where it's aware with all the buildup of thoughts that you're doing during the day. And then, believe me, it'll build up again. And that's fine, because you'll be there with your brush. Yeah. And it's just accepting that when you eat, meaning when you're involved with the world, thoughts build up, plaque builds up. Like that's, it's natural, okay? So you brush. It's a practice, remember. You know, we, we say it's a practice. We don't say it's a destination. Meditation is not a destination, okay? It's a practice over and over again, like brushing teeth. Take the magic and mystery away from it and just do it as a daily thing to keep some inner hygiene. I'm looking at this text and I'm asking myself, do I want to open it? <laughs> I'm wondering whether to even get started with this. Uh, but I really want to leave us with one thing. But just to, um, we were on page four, I think. But just to recap for those of us who weren't here. And I'm just going to share one paragraph with you because that's all the time we have. And even though I promised you that we were going to finish tonight, I ask your forgiveness for breaking that promise. <laughs> um, <laughs> the past two sessions basically were this, where we started it, the first page of this text was um, emphasizing the need to have what Dogen calls a way-seeking mind, that the Tenzo, the cook, needs to have the intention that what he or she is doing is as a practice of realizing the great way. That this is not just a practice I do in order to, you know, come back to the sitting. <clears throat> and I'm going to feed you so that we can get back and do the real thing. It is the real thing. That that activity, you bring in the intention and the activity becomes that. Not because it's a great activity but you make it great. Your intention makes the activity. The activity doesn't make you. And that was what he was emphasizing as, you know, a Tenzo has to know why she's doing what she's doing. You know? It's, it's, your mind makes it. That was, that was the main qualification for a Tenzo, is you have to have the way-seeking mind. You are seeking out the great way in everything you do. Whether it's cleaning rice, whether it's washing out, you know, the vegetables or whatever it's doing, whether it's choosing the mushrooms, it is the way-seeking mind. The other thing that then he continued with that afterwards was the unity of form and emptiness in cooking. <laughs> Meaning that 
you have a certain quality of non-judgmental quality, total acceptance and embracing the good in what you have. You know, the rich person is the one who's satisfied with what he has, right? And so here, the tenzo, the daily, the, the provisions, what they have to deal with, some wild grass, he says, you're going to make that into you know, a soup fit for the emperor. You have some rich, wonderful ingredients. Don't get on top of the world. Deal with it humbly, right? He said, take a, if you remember that line, you know, see a single blade of grass and make it into a 16-foot golden Buddha. See a 16-foot golden Buddha and make it into a blade of grass. It goes both ways. It's not looking around the world and saying, oh, Buddha, you know? It's looking at the Buddha and saying, piece of grass, right? It's both directions. Yeah? So that you can't ignore the world because you think that it's really all just empty. Oh, it's real. But that real is Buddha. So that was the unity form and emptiness in ingredients, in the ingredients you cook with. Mm. Okay. So I want to go to, um, I want to go where he says, when I was staying at Tiong Tong Jing Dei Si. Okay. You see where I am on page four, right in the middle, almost? All right. So when I was staying at Tiang Tong Jing, Jing Desi, a monk named Lu from Qinyang Fu held the post of Tenzo. Um, just as a background, uh, Dogen went away to China for three or four years searching because he didn't find any real, um, he wasn't happy with the state of Buddhism in Japan. So he left and went to China to try to study in some of the great monasteries there. And this was, he's reporting some of his experience. Once, following the noon meal, I was walking along the eastern covered walkway towards a sub temple called. Charon Hut. When I came upon him in front of the Buddha Hall, drying mushrooms in the sun, he had a bamboo stick in his hand and no hat covering his head. The heat of the sun was blazing on the paving stones. He looked very painful. His back was bent like a bow, and his eyebrows were as white as the feathers of a crane. I went up to the Tenzo and asked, How long have you been a monk? 68 years, he said. Why don't you have an assistant do this for you? Other people are not me. Venerable sir, I can see how you follow the way through your work. But still, why do you do this now when the sun is so hot? If not now, when? There is nothing else to say. As I continued on my way along the eastern corridor, I was moved by how important the work of the Tenzo is. <laughs> so these little exchanges uh, bring to real life examples of these of living this this approach of living the teachings. And here we see he came upon this Tenzo. You know the guy should be retired already, right? He's like late in his late seventies at least. Uh, what, is he, what is he doing in the hot sun, drawing mushrooms? And why doesn't he do it like a couple hours later? When it's, or why doesn't he have someone else do it? He has assistance. And the Tenzo is just clear as a bell. You know, he just knows. This is, this is my work. Like, I need to do this. Right? This is how I am realizing the weight. Right? This is how I'm realizing the way. Okay, so it's your job. Why don't you do another time? Like, when? You know? This is the moment. This is the moment. <laughs> yeah. And we look at that and we say, oh yeah, I'll do it later. Or, um, you know, I, 
it'll be fine later, right? Or why, why should I do this? And that sense of urgency and importance in the job that you're doing, whether it's drying mushrooms or sweeping the floor or I don't know what, standing in front of an audience and I don't know, giving the greatest lecture in the world or in the court of law or in an operating room or whatever that moment may be. That moment is your vital practice. This is what the Tenzo is saying. It's not just that he was doing the mushrooms, you know. He's basically saying like, this is my job. This is my way. Okay, this is how I realize truth in this moment. And I can't postpone it. If not now, when? If I don't wake up now, when will I wake up? He's not talking about drying mushrooms. He's talking about waking up. If I don't wake up now, when? Yeah, sure, the mushrooms can be dried later, but my mind cannot be awakened later. <laughs> it's not about mushrooms. And that's why I don't just, there's nothing else to say. <laughs> like, there's nothing else to say here. I've learned what I need to learn. He goes back to Japan soon after that. <laughs> But I really hope we find our way and, and awaken now together. <clears throat>